Hey everybody, it's Savannah again, and welcome to my video of how I made my 1840s morning dress. Now this dress was inspired by an actual extant garment included in Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion Book 1. In her books, Janet provides small grid patterns for each of the garments that she has examined. That is what I used to draft my pattern for this dress. You'll see me here drafting my pattern onto some wax paper laid over a poster board that I have drawn a one inch grid. This way I can use the poster board over and over again. Now this was only my second time drafting a pattern from a Janet Arnold book so it was a little bit messy. But you don't have to be perfect for the pattern to work out. Most of the time the pattern is not going to fit you anyways because it was made for somebody else to begin with. So make your pattern and then fit it to you. Once I had gotten all my pieces finished, I placed them together to make sure that they all fit properly. You can see here that I made a small mistake, but it was easily fixed. So here's my first mock-up, and as you can see, it was a little bit too big, but overall I was very happy with how the pieces actually fit with each other. So this is my final mock-up. I did a lot of slashing to make it fit me a lot tighter overall and I lengthened it but I decided I needed to lengthen it at least one more time so you'll see me do that when I cut out the actual fabric. Another issue is that arm, the side back seam right there, I knew that I needed to make it a little bit tighter at the armhole so it wouldn't bunch like that but overall I really liked the way it looked. Now the fabrics for this costume were stuff that we already had on hand. We had made a uniform out of this worsted navy wool previously, and this was like the over purchases that I made just in case I messed something up. And then the red is a red silk dupioni, and that was a clearance purchase at Joann's, believe it or not, and it was very non slubby so that made me happy. So when I went to cut out the bodice, I actually cut the pieces out one at a time instead of folded it and doubled up. This was because usually you will get a um, more accurate cut when you do that, but I accidentally didn't put my front pieces on the same grain so they're a little bit off. So learn from my mistakes guys. <laughs> now when I cut them out again with the wrong sides facing each other, I actually went ahead and chalked the dart in on one of the pieces. And you'll see me pat the pieces together at the end, that way I don't have to retrace out and measure where that dart is. Just a helpful tip if you're working with something that will show chalk really well. So in the 1830s and 1840s, they actually didn't line things the way that we do these days, which is called bagging out the way we do it now. They actually flatlined, which is putting the silk on top of the wool and then sewing the seams. So here you'll see me doing pad stitching, and it's just basically a stitch to secure the two pieces together they obviously didn't have um, fusible interfacing either. So that's what I did for each of the bodice pieces. And if you also have a careful eye, you'll see the cat interrupting me like three times. Now in order to get started on the construction of the actual bodice, I backstitched the darts closed and then moved on to making piping because each of the seams has piping in it. And you'll take each of these piping strips and sandwich them in between the seams. This one's the center front seam in order to get that finished look with the little piping bit peeping out.
Now here's a clip of the bodice put mostly together. You can see I've got piping along the top and the bottom now. And I'm just demonstrating how when you fold it over it creates that crisp look. Now before I can fold down and finish all of the bodice edges, I first have to whip stitch all of the seams on the inside. This prevents fraying but also gives me some very convenient boning channels. You'll probably have seen me measure out a piece of boning and then reinsert it back here inside of this clip. You'll also see me double check that I'm only catching the silk layer of the bodice and not the wool. Now that I've finished inserting all of the bonings and finishing all the seams, I can go around and tack down the piping on the perimeter of the bodice with a whip stitch to the silk layer only. This way all the seams will be finished in a crisp pipe. Now that the bodice was almost done, it was time to make eyelets on the back edge so that I could properly try the bodice on. I did this using an awl and carefully poking a hole into the fabric. You don't want to break any of the threads so that the eyelet remains strong. As a matter of fact, metal eyelets were not a thing until the later 1800s. And these embroidered eyelets are actually comparatively strong to them as long as you don't break the threads. I actually quite enjoyed making them. Now that the eyelets were finished, it was time to make the little Van Dyke bands that go down the front of the bodice. I decided to bag these out so that if somebody viewed the underside, it wouldn't look too messy. In this clip you'll see me adding the little red details to each of the Van Dyke pieces. I did this by taking a strip of the silk and turning it into a tube and then tacking it to the front and the back of the little Van Dyke band. Also you'll notice that the piping is wrinkled on the little serrated pieces. I do believe that's because I stretched it out too much whenever I was putting it on there so if you're going to be using this pattern. Just try not to do that over each of the little triangles and I think it should be fine. One piece ended up being better than the other. Once I got both of the Van Dyke pieces made, it was time to finally add them to the bodice. I did this by pinning them in place and then using a broad back stitch to tack them down. Now to complete the bodice it was time to finally make those sleeves. The sleeves were something that in my mind I kept seeing over and over again. I wanted that red heading and then the rest of it to be blue. I actually off screen went ahead and blocked out the rest of my fabric because I only had a limited amount and I wanted to make sure that I could get the skirt out as well. Here you'll see me taking two strips of that red silk and t attaching it as a header on top of the sleeve. I wanted to encase the raw edges inside of the silk so that there wouldn't be any on the inside of the sleeve except for the one edge. To make those gathered sleeve headings, I went ahead and marked intervals of half an inch with chalk down each side of the sleeve. I then proceeded to eye in the gathered stitch paths. I just wanted to make sure that they ended up in the same place. I actually did one sleeve before I started filming and I was very careful to try to make all the gathered stitches even. That was actually a bad idea because it made rows of gathers instead of making that crinkled effect. So it actually was very disheartened, had to undo it all and then redo it again. So you see here that I actually alternated between doing large stitches and then small stitches and that's what creates the actual crinkle look.
Now to make up the actual sleeve, it was time to sew up that center inside seam. You'll see me pinning it together and then marking where the cuff opening needs to be. Then I just proceeded to backstitch. Now to finish the arms eye seam, I decided to bind it. I didn't even trim back any of the seam allowance, I just felt like that would keep the garment structurally sound longer. But you'll see me take the strip of silk and backstitch it onto the inside of the armhole all the way around. And then when I finished that, I simply flip it over and fold it again, and then whip stitch that down so that no raw edges are visible. It does look a bit bulky and feel a little bit bulky in your arms but it actually is fairly comfortable because the seam points outwards when you're wearing it. To finish the sleeves, I added a cuff by using the rectangular pattern piece that I made previously. You simply gather the sleeve into the cuff and then encase the raw edges inside, securing everything down with a whip stitch. Now you may be wondering why I didn't add the piping to the cuffs to begin with, but because this fabric is much thicker than what the original silk would have been, I felt like I shouldn't add the piping inside of the seam because it was so bulky already. So I just took this piece of piping and turned it into a small rope and then whip stitched it to the cuff using a blue thread instead of a red one. I then added piping to the very edge of the cuff so that when the cuffs were secured closed with hooks and bars, it would look like continuous piping around the top and the bottom of the cuff. Now that both sleeves were finished, it was time to move on to the armbands. I decided to bag these out as well so that they would be all the way finished when on the arms. The worst part about making these was probably estimating how much piping to use for that inner piping ring, but I got it done and I think they turned out really great. To secure these armbands, I needed to make a fabric covered button. I did this by cutting a small circle a little bit larger than the button itself, then gathering it up and stitching multiple times until I felt it was secure.
I made my skirt by seaming together two large rectangular pieces about the height of my waist to floor measurement. I then made a 12 inch slash into the back piece and constructed a placket using normal methods. Now the original dress had a pleated skirt, but because this wool is so much thicker than what the original silk would have been, I decided I needed a cartridge pleat instead. Here you'll see me doing a whip stitch around the edge to mimic almost what you would be doing with a serger. This was so that the edge of the fabric would not fray over time. Now cartridge pleating was a historical way of gathering a skirt onto a waistline. You take your skirt and you fold it over at the top towards the inside, accommodating for any points that the bodice may take. Then you carefully gather the pleats onto a leader thread, or like a giant gathering stitch basically. You'll see me here having to untangle mine. But you do this until you get to the very end, and then you attach the skirt to the bodice using only the top corner of these pleats. This method allows all the bulk of the skirt seam to go out to the sides instead of up into the bodice. Here is a clip of the cartridge pleats finished. You'll see the outside of the skirt is plain, and then on the inside you'll see the folded over edges. And the deepest point right there is where the point of the bodice will be. That way it will still follow along the lines of the bodice, but the hem will still be flat. To attach the skirt to the bodice, I carefully took pins and matched up the back edges with the back edges of the skirt, the side seams with the side seams of the skirt, and the front point with the front point of the skirt. I then took a strong buttonhole thread and put two stitches into each of the top layers of each pleat, carefully distributing the pleats as I went and trying my best to catch both the silk and the wool of the seam allowance that was there to make a strong connection. Once I made it to the end of the cartridge pleats, I carefully tied off the end of the gathering string. This string remains inside of the skirt to keep the structure of the pleats when you wear it. Since I decided to make this bodice lace up instead of secure clothes with hooks and bars, I decided I also needed to make a modesty panel. This would prevent any underpinnings from showing in between the laces. To do this, I just took a rectangular piece of wool and lined it just like you would do any other garment, and then matched it up with the height of the bodice. I then whip stitched it in place and secured it to the placket. The final step to this dress was to do the hem. I decided to use a hem tape, or in this case, a matte ribbon, instead of doing like a double folded method, so that the hem would be nice and crisp and not too bulky with this thicker worsted wool. I simply whip stitched the hem tape onto the right side of the wool, and then flipped it up and over and whip stitched it back to the wrong side of the wool so that there would be a perfect hem finished and all of the rough edges of the wool would be enclosed. I then pressed the hem and she was done.